Well, I'm very excited to share a beautiful passage from the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna that I read today. I just love the way that he describes this monk and then a conversation that he has with one of his very close uh, devotees or students named M. So it reads like this, once a Vedantic monk came here, and this is Ramakrishna talking about the temple in Dakshineshwar, so the Vedantic monk came to visit him at the temple. He used to dance at the sight of a cloud. He would go into ecstasy of joy over a rainstorm. He would get very angry if anyone went near him while he meditated. One day I came to him while he was meditating, and that made him very cross. He discriminated constantly. Discernment, you know, thinking about in mind what is real, what is not real. Brahman alone, which means God alone, is real. And the world, this universe we live in, is illusory. Since the appearance of diversity is due to Maya, or due to this not seeing things as they are, kind of projecting our own reality onto things. Since the appearance of diversity is due to Maya, he walked about with a prism from a chandelier in his hand. One sees different colors through that prism. In reality, there is no such thing as color. Likewise, nothing exists in reality except Brahman, the divine. But there is an appearance of the manifold because of Maya or egoism, which is us taking a, a perspective of a, a particular. You know, we, uh, egoism means the spirit moves into a set of limitations and restrictions that are associated with body and mind. And so from that perspective, we begin to measure the world, draw relationships to everything around us. And of course, it's a false, it's a falseness. Uh, this, this perspective, this point of view is like the point of view of the dreamer inside the dream. You know, the dreamer and the dream, they really have very little in common. And yet the dreamer enters into the dream thinking that he is inside the dream thinking that the dream can affect him and that what can be done in the dream is being done in, in, in actuality. But he wakes up to find a very different perspective, one where the dream is understood as being completely illusory. So this is what the, these great souls are talking about here. But there is an appearance of the manifold because of maya or egoism. He would not look at an object more than once, lest he should be deluded by maya, and attachment, which means, you know, draw, create some sort of desire or some sort of longing for that object. He would discriminate while taking his bath at the sight of birds flying in the sky. He knew grammar, meaning Sanskrit. He stayed here for three days. One day he heard the sound of a flute down by the embankment and said that a man who had realized Brahman would go into an ecstatic state from such a sound. And that association with divine love, a pure and unconditioned love. While talking about the monk, the master showed his devotees the manners and movements of a Paramahamsa, or someone who has seen God, someone who has had that highest realization. The gait of a child, a face beaming with laughter, eyes swimming in joy, and a body completely naked, then he again took his seat on the small couch and poured out his soul enthralling words to the devotees. Master, turning to M, I learned Vedanta from Nangta. Brahman alone is real. This world is illusory. The magician performs his magic. He produces a mango tree and it even bears mangoes. But this is all a sleight of hand. The magician alone is real. M answers, it seems that the whole of life is a long sleep. This much I understand, that we are not seeing things rightly. We perceive the world with a mind by which we cannot comprehend even the nature of the sky. So how can our perceptions be correct? The master, there's another way of looking at it. We do not see the sky rightly. It looks as if the sky were touching the ground at the horizon. But can man see correctly? His mind is delirious, like the mind of a typhoid patient. The master sang in his sweet voice a song that goes like this. What a delirious fever is this that I suffer from, O mother, 
Your grace is my only cure. Continuing, the master said, Truly it is a state of delirium. Just see how worldly men quarrel among themselves. No one knows what they quarrel about. Oh, how they quarrel. <laughs> May such and such a thing befall you. So much shouting, so much abuse. M. I said to Kishori, the box is empty. There's nothing inside. But two men pull at it from either side, thinking the box contains money. Well, the body alone is the cause of all this mischief, is it not? The Ghanis see all this and say to themselves, what a relief one feels when this pillowcase drops off. Meaning the body, meaning death. You know, what a relief when this illusion is finished with. The master and the M continue. They walk toward the temple of Kali. The master says about that comment, why should you say such things? This world is, in fact, a framework of illusion. But it is also said that it's a mansion of mirth. Let the body remain. One can also turn this world into a mansion of mirth. M. But where is the unbroken bliss in this world? Master. Mm, yes. Where is it? Sri Ramakrishna stood in front of the shrine of Kali and prostrated himself before the Divine Mother. M. followed him. Then the master sat on the lower floor in front of the shrine room, facing that blissful image, leaned against the pillar of the Natmandir. He wore a red-bordered cloth, part of which was on his shoulder and back, and M sat by his side. M, since there's no unbroken happiness in the world, why should one assume a body at all? I know that the body is meant only to reap the results of past action, but who knows what sort of actions we're performing even now? The unfortunate part is that we're being crushed. Master, if a pea falls into filth, it grows into a pea plant nonetheless. See this wonderful perspective. First of all, to know the divine is the highest joy. It is the unbroken bliss of this world. You know, if you can go inside, if you can transcend the sense of ego, if you can touch that inner shrine, there's a great bliss that hides behind these eyes of ours, behind this mind of ours, behind this body of ours. A great bliss that can bring such things about like dancing at the sight of a cloud or to go into ecstasy of joy over a rainstorm. We've all had those poetic flights of insight. I know when I look at the mountains outside, I feel that, or the fresh snow on the branches of a tree and the setting sun shining through it. There are ways to be reminded of the divine, but the best is to find it within, find it inside yourself. That is how this world becomes a mansion of mirth. That's how this unbearable delusion of a world which seems to have no meaning or depth to it becomes profound, becomes beautiful, becomes worthy of living.